We're going to go ahead and get started. I want to finish up this segment that we've been working on. So today we're continuing with freedom from addiction, and this is part 11. And we're going to continue with what we started last week, which is the topic of growing in faith and getting into freedom from fear. Okay, so um, last time, okay, so where we are in the process, we're talking about growing in faith. So as we ourselves are coming out of addiction or as we're, you know, discipling or sponsoring someone out of addiction, one of the important things that we have to do is to grow in faith. And so we started last time, we talked about four topics. Um, first of all, we need to know God's goodwill and then add to it testimonies. And when we do that, faith is established and that leads to fruitfulness, not only for our own personal lives, but for the people around us. Then we looked at a few examples of faith leading to great outcomes, both you know having faith to receive things for yourself and then having faith and thus having the ability to help others effectively. And that's where we all want to be. We want to be in a place of personal victory, and we want to be in a place where we have faith to help others. Okay, then we talked about um, discipling, and we need some content to help with that, right? So we have we talked about some resources that you can use to help disciple people and just establish a basic faith in them. We have teaching that's available that you can leverage. We have uh, other teachers and ministries that we've recommended. So um, we talked about that. And then there's, we need to add testimonies to whatever teaching we're taking, whatever Bible reading we're doing. We need to add testimonies because that will make the 2000 year old scriptures make it present tense. And it makes it easier to believe when you see present life examples of the word of God coming true. Okay. So today we're going to continue with this and we're going to talk about um, the need to eliminate ungodly inputs and to build a positive network. We're going to talk about what Jesus said. He said, do not be afraid, only believe. Then we'll do a comparison of faith in God versus faith in the devil. And then we're going to take a look at the cost of fear. And there can be tremendous costs of fear. And Job's an example of that. And we don't want to be a Job, right? We want to learn from Job, but we don't want to be a Job. All right, so that's what we're going to do today. Okay, so here let's talk about we need to eliminate ungodly inputs and we need to build a positive network. And again, what we're talking about here, it doesn't have to be only applied for an addiction scenario. So all of us can do these things and all of us may need some cleaning up of the, the inputs that we have in our life and we all may need to add more positive things. So to be strong in faith and live in victory over sin and addiction, we need to eliminate ungodly inputs from our lives and build a godly network of people and positive inputs from TV, radio, internet, and any other source. Okay, so we want to do two things. We want to eliminate certain things, and we want to fill up on other good things. So we want to eliminate sinful people. And this can be hard for somebody who's lived sinfully in addiction, because chances are a lot of their friend network are, still, are people that are still stuck in that old lifestyle. And so we have to cut these people out, right? I mean, at, at a future point in time, they need to be ministered to. But as for somebody who's coming out of addiction, they can't be hanging around people that are still involved in sin. They can't be hanging around people that are still involved in drinking and drugging and promiscuity or things like that. They, they can't have those kind of negative influences because they're still in an extreme weak place, right? Okay, we need to eliminate things like any kind of TV or radio or internet or radio or, oh, I guess I have radio choice. Any kind of, any kind of input, TV, radio, internet, books, that any content that's just filled with sin or filled with violence or drugs or alcohol or ungodliness or scornfulness towards God or scornfulness towards faith. So any of those kind of negative inputs, we need to cut them out. And that's pretty much almost all TV, right? Um, so we need to cut that out. It's going to help a lot. You know, the, the more negative inputs that are coming in, the more ungodly inputs that are coming in, that's warring against our faith, it's warring against our holiness, it's producing temptation, it's legitimizing sin, it's doing all sorts of negative things. And especially for somebody who's coming out of a bad situation with sin and addiction, it's, um, it's really dangerous, right? Then we need to counter that by filling up with, you know, fill our lives with people 
who already have victory over sin and addiction. You know, so you can get this from a sponsor. You can get this from people like in the veterans and the AA meeting or just any kind of good and holy person. You need to have add to your life people who are great in faith, people who live godly and promote godly living. Then we also need to fill up on godly programs on TV, radio, internet, godly books, godly meetings, godly events. And so we just need to make a switch from filling up on what the devil's doing to filling up on what God is doing. Amen. So cut out the the evil inputs and fill up on godly inputs. And it's easier said than done because a lot of our entertainment is centered around the devil, right? And that's unfortunate, but it's true. So it's really, it's going to take some effort to kind of cut out those things that were previously entertaining or whatever and try and switch over to God. But we need to pray about that and God will give us strength to do that. Okay, so this is very important because, you know, faith works in a positive and a negative direction. And faith in God and faith in the devil, they both come the same way. So the mechanism is by what we're feeding on. So in Romans 10, 17, it says, So then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Okay, so you can fill in the blanks a little bit here. And this mechanism of building faith, it's true whether we're talking about Father God or, you know, the God of this world, the devil. So faith in in God, um, it, it'll come by hearing. Like if you hear the word of God, if you hear of godly testimonies, if, if you hear of victory stories, if you hear of words of encouragement, you know, so any kind of words like that, those are godly words, and those will establish faith in God himself. Amen? So that's that's good. So whatever you're inputting into your eyes and ears, it's going to produce faith in God if those are good and godly inputs, right? Especially, you know, accurate, accurate Bible study, teaching, preaching, and testimonies. That's going to produce faith. Well, in the same way, Faith in the devil, it comes the same way. You know, whatever you know, whatever you're listening to, whatever you're watching, if you're you know busy listening to what the devil is saying, if you're listening to the devil's you know evil will, if you're listening to the, the devil's sinful temptation, you know, you're gonna establish, you know, faith in the devil's direction, right? And you know, we can call that a couple different things. You know, faith in the devil. It would be fear. You know, fear is a strong expectation that something negative is going to happen. So that's the, the, you know, fear is faith. It's just in a different God. Fear is faith in the devil. You know, fear is a negative faith, whereas faith in God is a positive faith. Okay, so if you are fearful about various things, then that's, a, your confidence is placed in the devil. If you are doubtful, if you're doubting God's word, then that means you're believing what the devil is saying to you. So you're having faith in the devil. If you're worrying, you know, worrying is a milder form of a fear. You're kind of meditating upon bad things happening. So you're meditating upon the devil's will. And that is, that's in a negative faith direction. Okay. So whatever we're filling up on, it's going to either lead us into faith in God or it's going to lead us into faith in the devil. Or, you know, a lesser case of it might be it's, it's going to weaken our faith in God if we're listening to too much of what the devil's talking about. All right. So when we clean up our inputs and fill up on good and godly things, then we're going to greatly enhance our faith and we're going to clear away doubts. We're going to clear away worries. We're going to clear away fears. Okay. In Psalm, um, Psalm one, it tells us what we need to do. So if we want to be a blessed man, if we want to be fruitful in life, if we want to be strong and healthy and not wither, if we want everything that we do to prosper, then we need to do what Psalm one says it says blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the path of sinners nor sits in the seat of the scornful but his delight is in the word of god and in his word he meditates day and night he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season whose leaf also shall not wither and whatever he does shall prosper. Okay, so this is advice to be steadfast in faith. So we need to clean up our inputs. He says, do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Okay, so ungodly people, sinful people, scornful people, 
they're going to have a negative impact upon us. You know, ungodly people, um, they're people that just don't believe in God and they behave in an ungodly manner. And so if you're hanging around ungodly people or if you get wisdom, you know, we shouldn't go to non-believers and ask them for wisdom about life situations because they're going to give you a world's perspective. We should get our perspective about how to deal with problems from somebody who is in faith, somebody who knows God, somebody who knows the word of God. And so we don't want ungodly advice, right? Um, and in the same way, we don't want to hang around with sinners. We have a role to play with sinners, which is to minister to them, but we're not to hang around with them. So if we're hanging around with sinners, then we're going to see the sins that they're committing. And some of those might be enticing. They might be drinking or drugging or involved in, you know, sex or whatever. And sin, you know, originally sin is fun. And then it gets to where it turns bad on you, right? It turns back around on you in a negative way. So we don't want to be around people that are active in their sin and be enticed by it. You know, we want to stay holy. We want to stay away from temptation as much as possible. And um, so we don't want to hang around with sinners. We don't want to hear their war stories about how they went out partying and all the, the things that they've been doing. Because again, those can easily draw us in a wrong direction, especially if we're talking about a person whom we're discipling out of addiction, you know, they're already weak and they've been living in a vulnerable state. And so they need to avoid as much temptation as possible. Okay. Then we have people that are scornful and a scornful person can be a believer and it can also be non-believers. So in fact, I remember when I first learned about healing, I was so excited. I was like, man, I just can't believe this is so amazing. You know, um, I had listened to this teaching from Andrew Womack, God Wants You Well, and then I had taken an eight-hour class from his Bible college called Healing by Barry Bennett, and I mean, faith just arose, and I was praying for people, and they were getting healed, and I was so excited. I'm like, man, this is the most amazing thing. I have to tell the whole world, and so I, I made a PowerPoint presentation on healing, and I sent it to the Christian, the Christian distribution list, the email distribution list at my job. And so there's a couple hundred people that were in that distribution list. And I got blasted. I got blasted by these people. I mean, these are supposedly they're Christians, but they blasted me for believing that God wants everyone healed. They blasted me for thinking that I could pray for somebody and they would be healed. I mean, they just, I was attacked by Christians. I was like, oh my God, what is, what is going on here? I'm telling them good news and they're mad at me. So scornfulness can take different forms. You know, anybody who is speaking against the promises of God, they are scornful. They are anti-promise of God. You know, they might be born again. They might believe that their sins are forgiven. They might go to heaven when they die, but they may disbelieve in healing and they try and talk you out of it. They may disbelieve in prosperity and they try and talk you out of it. They may disbelieve in authority and Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and and whatever else, and they try and talk you out of it, or they, they come against you. So that is scornfulness, okay? And, you know, an ungodly person would be, you know, they could be scornful. An ungodly person is just simply not going to be born again, and so they're going to have just general negative influence. But even with amongst Christians, many of them are scornful, and they oppose you on the promises of God. And so we need to cut that out of our life, okay? And it's not just individuals. Like, um, it's also certain denominations, they are against the promises of God. Certain churches are against the promises of God. So just you need to pick where you go and who you're going to listen to. And you don't want to have things in your life that are warring against you to believe in the great and precious promises of God. Amen. So these are the things we need to eliminate. And so on the contrary, Rather than consuming those things, we need to delight in the Word of God. We need to meditate on the Word of God. We need to you know, meditate not only on His Word, but word about what He's doing, you know, testimonies. When we tell each other victory stories about what God is doing in our lives, when we watch little videos that other people make or whatever, as long as we're consuming testimonies and thinking about that, that's a, a faith-building thing. If we're consuming, you know, good Bible teaching and thinking about it and meditating upon it, all these things, we're going to get strengthened in faith and we're going to be prosperous. We're going to be fruitful. We're going to be strong and healthy and we shall succeed in everything that we do. 
Amen. And this is where we want to be. This is how we want to live. Okay. And then Proverbs 12, 26, this one is pretty straightforward. The righteous should choose his friends carefully for the way of the wicked leads them astray. And that doesn't really need any explanation or, or add on. It's crystal clear. You know, choose your friends carefully. The wicked leads them astray. So we need to remove the ungodly and the sinners and the scornful from our lives. And that's going to be a huge benefit for us. And again, remember, this is the context of we're ministering to somebody coming out from addiction. So they have a big life change that needs to happen. And they need someone to help motivate them and encourage them to cut off a whole segment of their network, you know, ungodly friends. And so they're going to need some help and a push, a nudge to to actually do that. Amen. Then what we want to do is we want to increase in faith building inputs and we want to decrease in faith killing inputs. So we're just going to look at a few contrasting points here. So what we need to consume is Jesus centric new covenant Bible study. Okay, so we are called to be, you know, we are in the new covenant. We should spend our time studying about Jesus. We need to focus on an image of God that looks like Jesus, just as he was in the gospels. That is a true and correct image of God. That's what we need to focus on. We need to stay away from churches, preachers, teachers that are stuck back in the old covenant, teaching about law and curse. We are redeemed from that. It has nothing to do with us. We don't need to consume any of that. It'll only cause confusion and lead us in the wrong direction. Okay, we need to fill up on godly testimonies and just victory testimonies of any kind. Just fill up on positivity, especially when they give credit to God, right? We want to just fill up on that constantly. Like this morning, unfortunately, I woke up at 4 a.m. just out of the blue, and I couldn't go back to sleep. So I just have, you know, I have Chicken Soup for the Soul, some new Miracles book that they have. And I woke up and I read like four little short stories. You know, so I just have these little short stories on my phone. And, um, you know, whenever you have a gap in the day or you want to kill some time or you feel down, you just read a little story, right? And it'll pump you back up. It'll bolster your faith. Okay, and what, what we want to cut out is we want to cut out the devil's words and the devil's testimonies. And so if you're spending your time talking to sinners, then they're going to be bragging about who they had sex with, how much they drank, what party they went to, stuff like that. Okay, that's definitely going to lead us in the wrong direction. If you're watching the news, then, you know, 50 of the 60 minutes, if not more, is going to be, you know, testimonies of what the devil's doing. You know, buildings that burned, rapes, murders, war, whatever. It's like 90% negative, right? So as you're watching the news, you're generally just filling up on the devil's testimonies. Well, you know, if we only filled up on God's testimonies as much as we do the devil's, it would be amazing how strong faith would be in this earth. Like if you could just flip the script on news. And so instead of like 50 minutes of devil, 10 minutes of neutral content, if we could flip that script and it was 50 minutes of what God has been doing, you know, just every kind of victory story you can find in the earth on a particular day. And then 10 minutes of weather and sports or whatever. Could you imagine the faith that people would have? Amen. I mean, it's phenomenal. All right. Then we want to increase in having people in our lives, like Christians in our lives that actually believe in full salvation. You know, so especially if you're shopping for a church, there's only some churches that actually believe in more than I get to go to heaven when I die. Well, we need to seek out and find those churches. We need to find churches and people that believe in authority, that believe in the Holy Spirit, that believe in the power of God, that believe in miracles and, and healing and dead raising and protection and provision and, and all of that goodness that Jesus paid for. We need people like that and a church like that in our life, right? And we need to get rid of, you know, people that are like failure minded. You know, you know, we all know somebody who's negative and you just like dread having a conversation with them because they're going to suck all the life out of you. They're going to pour all their negativity, all their failure. They're going to pour it upon you. And we don't want to be around that kind of input. We need to cut that out. Okay. On the positive side, we want to have more and more conversations that are inspiring faith, that are talking about victory, talking about overcoming. So just orient it in a positive, godly direction. And we want to cut out 
like anti-faith conversations. You know, like there's certain people, um, well, like if you're around sinners, they're going to be glamorizing sin, drugs, alcohol, sex, things like that. Those are obviously anti-faith. Um, you, you don't want to be talking to people that are always telling you failure stories, you know, who died this week, who's sick, who has cancer, how hard everything is, how hard life is. You know, the, the, they just suck the life out of you. Like, you don't want to be around that. It just destroys your faith. If all you ever hear about is who's sick and dying, then it's going to erode your belief in God for healing, right? And so we have to be careful what we're listening to. We don't want to be around these anti-faith, anti-promise of God people and conversations. We want to stay away from that. You know, if you're going to tell me about a sick person, let's just tell me briefly and let's pray for them. But don't be telling, you know, don't be pouring just negativity upon people. All right. Then we mentally what we want to do is we want to build our faith just by replaying personal victories, replay testimonies in your mind. You know, we, we should always be thinking about what has God done in my life? And so something that we can do, and we'll have this on our list of things next week as far as spiritual habits, is that having a God log, you know, a journal, a diary, where you're just keeping track of all the things that God does in your life, you know, keeping track of answered prayers, keeping track of answered prayers not only for yourself but for other people. And when you do that, then you can reflect back on your journal and you can like, wow, look what God has done in my life. And so it's going to bolster your faith. And then the other thing you do with that is you share it with other people. And so as you're sharing your victories with other people, they're strengthened in faith. And then you're also stirred up again in faith. And then all the while that you're sharing your testimony, God is receiving glory as well. Uh, amen. So it's really powerful to replay your victories. Okay. Then we um, we want to we want to stay away from people that are kind of realistic, realistic money. If, if you're realistic, then you really have just cut God out of the equation, right? If all you can think about is what is realistic, that's in very human terms. And so if people who are realistic, and I'm just stating the facts, if that's as far as you can go, you haven't gone beyond what man can do. That's not even faith. You know, a realistic person, they're not really in faith. You know, we have to think beyond what the boundaries of man, you know, to get into what God can do, right? So people who are just always, let's just be realistic about this. You know, the diagnosis is they have a 10% chance of living. They're going to die. Well, that doesn't do you any good. That just destroys your faith. So you don't want to be around realistic people. You don't want to consume their wisdom around realism. You don't want to consume too much of what science and medicine says. You don't want to consume too much of what world experts say. Because, you know, God will make the wisdom of this world foolish to those who believe, right? And so we need to believe. So what we want, rather than being around a lot of realistic-minded people, we want to be around some unrealistic-minded people. We want to be around some people that are going to talk about miracles and operating in power and just, you know, beyond human ability, but people that believe in miracles and that share stories about it. Okay? Then... We also want to eliminate, we want to stop researching the problems. Like when we have a problem in life, like a primary first reaction that many people have is they'll go spend hours on the internet. Let's just say a doctor tells somebody, I'm sorry, you have cancer and here's your diagnosis. This is the name of the disease. The first thing they're going to do is they're going to go spend the next week on the internet, eight hours a day, just researching everything they can about this cancer with the prognosis is, what the chance of living is, what the treatments are, how bleak it is, looking at pictures. And by the time they're finished doing all this in-depth deep dive on the problem, they have completely destroyed any chance of faith. Okay, so when, when you have a problem in life, you just need to know a little bit about it. Okay, just a little bit. Not You don't need to dive into it. Just know a little bit about it, enough to pray against it effectively. Right. So instead of spending your time researching the problem, you want to spend your time researching God's answers to problems. And this is where faith comes. You want to research God's answers to the problems in the Bible, and you want to find example testimonies of victory. And this is so important, especially in life and death situations. If you fill up on, you know, researching the problem and man's solutions to it, you're just going to erode your faith. So it's so important. Research what God has to say. Amen. And cut this other input out. Otherwise, it, it'll war against you. 
Okay, now Jesus told us, he said, do not be afraid, only believe. So fear and faith, they're the same substance, but they're on opposite ends of the spectrum. Fear and faith are both faith, their belief, their expectation, yet they're in opposing deities. Okay, so fear is actually, it's faith in the devil's evil will of failure, of lack, of sickness, of steal, of kill, of destroy, of curse, of calamity, and so on. Okay, so fear is literally is faith in the devil. And if we would get a, a picture in our mind of that, it would really help us stay away from fear. You know, when you are in fear, your trust is in the devil and you need to kill that immediately. Okay, fear is dangerous. Okay, now good faith, obviously this is believing in God's goodwill of life, of long life, of health, of healing, of provision, of protection, of victory, and any other good thing, right? And so both of these are faith. And so we want to make sure we don't have fear, which is faith in the devil. So if we do have fear, then we need to you know, seek to eliminate it. And we're going to talk about how to do that. So if you are strong in fear, you will receive evil things from the devil whom your negative faith is in. If you are strong in good faith, then you will receive good things from God whom your positive faith is in. Okay, so faith works in both directions. It works positive and it works negative. And so that's why fear is dangerous. And just as one example verse, and there's many that we could look at, but we'll just look at Proverbs 18, 20 to 21 to prove that that statement is true. Fear works in both directions, positive and negative. A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips, he shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Okay, so in many times in Proverbs, also in the book of James, and elsewhere in the Bible, constantly the Holy Spirit is telling us that we need to be careful, you know, what we're believing, and especially what we're speaking. What we're believing and speaking, that's an operation in faith. And so when you're believing in negative, evil, fearful things, unbeknownst to you, your faith is in the devil, and the Bible's clear, it says death is in the power of your tongue. And so if we're believing in the devil's evil will, a failure, lack, sickness, steal, kill, destroy, curse, calamity, if we're having all these negative expectations, if we're having this fear going on, our faith is in the devil. And if we were to speak forth those fears, that's an operation in faith. And we will draw forth death, sickness, disease, lack, calamity, destruction, you know, all those things that our faith is in, our fearful, negative faith is in. So we, we have to be careful. So we want to make sure that we're believing in, in God's goodwill. We want to make sure that our tongue has a, a practice, a habit of just speaking God's goodwill constantly. And a daily scripture confession habit will help with that. Amen. So the important thing here is faith works in the devil's direction and it works in God's direction. So we need to fill our heart with what God says, with his goodwill and we need to make sure our tongue is speaking in alignment with God. And we need to cut out all the fears and all the devilish inputs that are building that fear. And we need to fill up on the word of God and testimonies. And then that fear will evaporate and we'll be filled with faith. And then we'll have a good experience in life. Okay. And let's look at an example of how Jesus was dealing with people to try and manage fear and, and try and guide people away from fear. So let's read in Luke chapter 8. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter about 12 years of age, and she was dying. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Do not be afraid, only believe, and she shall be made well. When he came into the house, he permitted no one to go inside except Peter, James, and John, and the father and mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her. But he said, Do not weep, she is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside, took her by the hand, and called, saying, Little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned, and she arose immediately. 
and he commanded that she be given something to eat. Okay, now look at what Jesus is doing in this passage. So he's trying to make sure that fear is avoided. You know, so the first thing, as soon as they said his daughter was there, he's like, do not be afraid, only believe. Okay, so this fear and faith, it's again, it's the same thing. One is trusting in Father God, the other one's trusting in the God of this world, the devil. If you are afraid, your faith is in the devil. If you are believing, your faith is in God. So we need to make sure we have that positive faith. Okay, so in a situation like this, obviously, you know, it's very likely that fear is going to arise. You know, you have people that are weeping and mourning. You know, when you hear people crying and weeping about somebody who died, that's like a sinking in a sense of permanency. Like, you know, this is this is a bad situation. Everybody's crying. She's dead. You know, death is permanent. You know, and so at, the more you're hearing that weeping and mourning, the harder and harder it's becoming to think that there's a way out of that situation. Okay, so let's look at what Jesus did. So why did Jesus tell them not to weep? He said, do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. Okay, because he was trying to calm the emotions and reduce the opportunity for fear. If you let emotion overtake you, emotion's gonna pull you in a negative direction. Emotion's gonna pull you straight into fear. And so, you know, in a critical situation like this, we have to learn to try and shut off the emotions to some extent. Because if we just start boo-hooing and just get you know to where we're despairing, it's going to be harder and harder to muster up any faith to deal with the situation. So emotions can be dangerous, right? So Jesus was trying to um, steer them away from all the weeping and mourning to calm, calm them down and to keep them away from fear. Okay, now why did Jesus you know say that she was sleeping? You know, if you say that she's sleeping, then you expect them to wake up. If you say that she's dead, then it's it's permanent in our minds, right? So Jesus was, was trying to avoid fearful thinking and instill a sense of hope and faith for life and healing because we perceive death as permanent, okay? And, you know, somebody might say, well, Jesus is lying. Well, he wasn't lying because from God's perspective, to God, she's only asleep and he can wake her up whenever he wants to, right? So his perspective, death is more like sleep. It wasn't a permanent situation, but he wants the people to think that she's asleep. He wants the people not to lay hold of the death word, which is permanent, but the sleep word, which is temporary. So again, he's trying to mitigate fear. Okay, then, you know, why did Jesus limit who could go into the house and why did he kick other people out? Okay, so like in this culture, whenever somebody died, they would literally, they would hire people to like weep and wail. You know, it was one of the things they did in their culture. So you have all these people, some of them family and others were like hired mourners that they come and they're weeping and wailing to kind of mourn the loss of a person. And so Jesus didn't let everybody in the house. He said he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John and the parents. Okay, well, we know that Peter, James, and John, they had already seen Jesus raising the dead, healing the sick. They themselves had already been healing the sick and casting out demons. So these people, Peter, James, and John, they're definitely in faith, All right? So they're going to bring strength to the situation. They're, they're not going to come against the situation. They're not going to bring doubt to the table, but they've already experienced the miraculous. So they're going to be positive people and good people to have around when you're dealing with the situation, right? Okay, and then he let the mother and father came in, whom he instructed to not be afraid, right? So he's trying to, he wants to involve them, but then he's, He's kicking out all these other people. You know, he's, where is it, where is it at? He put them all out. In verse 54, all these people that are weeping and wailing, he put them all outside, right? So why is he doing that? So he's trying to eliminate sources of doubt, eliminate sources of unbelief, eliminate negative words and actions, because all those things are going to produce fear. And if they all enter into fear, then this little girl is going to stay dead and she's not going to be resurrected. Okay, so you can see the power of, of fear versus believing. And that's why Jesus dealt with this situation in, in this unique way. He was trying to steer everyone away from fear. So we need to keep that in mind. Amen? Okay, so John 10.10. 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I, Jesus, have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Okay, so if you align your expectations and beliefs 
with the one who steals, kills, destroys, the one who makes sick. Um, who is your faith unknowingly in? It's it's in the devil. Amen. So if we're expecting you know negative things in life, our faith is in the devil, and we need to get out of fear because it's dangerous. Like as we saw in Proverbs eighteen to twenty one. You know, we can bring forth death and every manner of, of trouble if we have faith in a negative direction. We saw from Jesus that you have to get rid of the fear, stay away from fear, because if you're in fear, then you're going to experience negative outcomes. So fear is dangerous and we need to eliminate that. Okay, so let's talk about some comparison points about faith in God versus faith in the devil. And so Jesus said, do not be afraid, only believe. Okay, so you have a, a spectrum. We'll just call it a faith continuum. On one side, you have fear, which is faith in the, in the devil. On the other side, you have good faith, positive faith, which is faith in God. And you could take some words and kind of lay them on this continuum. You know, so if you're wishful, you know, if you're wishful thinking, it's not really faith, but it's kind of a a not very realistic, hopeful expectation of something good. So it's just a very, you know, mild, um, you're, you're wanting something positive, but there's not much belief attached to it. You know, as you get into hopeful, then there's a little bit more expectation with hope. You know, a hope is stronger than a wish. And so that's moving further in a positive direction. But then if you get to the point where you're literally expecting good to happen, then that, that is a true good faith, right? And as you're expecting things, as you're praying things with expectation, they will happen because that expectation, that is true, legitimate faith in God. Okay, then going in the negative direction, you know, anxiety would be on the milder side of things. If you're anxious, you're kind of, you know, nervous about possible negative outcomes, it's not super strong yet. Then maybe you start worrying, worrying, you're meditating over potential negative outcomes more and more. So worry is a little bit stronger. Then you get to a point of expectation of evil, which we call dread. So if you get to a point of dread, then that is a strong faith. And it's a strong faith. You know, dread is a strong faith. It is a strong expectation of like some kind of impending doom, impending evil. And that is a strong faith in the devil. And we want to definitely stay away from that. Right. So. So this is kind of the faith continuum, and we want to be all the way over here on the right. So let's just look at some comparison points. So if we are believing and trusting in God, then obviously that's faith in God. If we are doubting God, okay, that's actually faith in the devil. If we are directly trusting the devil, that's faith in the devil. If we're expecting, you know, evil things to happen, if we're expecting sickness, you know, it's flu season, I know I'm going to get the flu. Okay, well, your faith is in the devil to give you the flu, okay? Um, if you are expecting death, uh, if you are expecting destruction, if you're expecting failure, if you're expecting any of these kind of negative things to come true, that's that's the devil's will. Your faith is literally in the devil, okay? So we don't want that. If we are expecting good things, you know, things aligned with God's good will, like protection, health, healing, provision, blessings in life, victory in life, then obviously our faith is in God. Okay, when we talk about faith in God, faith is strengthened by victory testimonies. In the same way, fear is strengthened by failure testimonies, by watching the news and seeing all that the devil's doing, watching the news, by listening to naysayers and scornful people, by listening to people sharing their just failure stories. Um, all that's going to build fear, which is faith in the devil. Okay, well, fear, fear, faith in the devil it is strengthened by continuing to worry about something. Like worry is a form of meditation, right? So you can meditate in a positive direction and you can meditate in a negative direction. And we call meditation in a negative direction, we call that worry. And so as humans, unfortunately, we're very good at meditating, but we tend to do it on fearful things. Like we're, we're worrying about a hundred different ways something could go wrong. And you keep thinking about it and thinking about it from every different angle. You're thinking about how something can go wrong. And you're just increasing your belief in that negative thing happening because you're meditating upon it. You're worrying upon it. And so that's going to strengthen your faith in the devil. And you're more likely to receive a bad thing. Well, we need to flip that over. And instead of that, we need to meditate on God's goodwill. We need to 
imagine instead of imagining a hundred ways that a situation could go wrong, imagine a hundred ways the situation could go right and lead to victory. Amen. So we have to do that. We have to meditate in a positive direction. Meditate on the promise of God. Meditate on a related testimony that would bring victory to a situation. And that's what we have to do instead. Okay, so faith in God is defeated. It's canceled when fear arises. Okay, and then on the contrary, fear is defeated when faith in God arises. So if we're, whatever topic we're fearful about, then we need to consume teaching and testimonies to mitigate those fears. You know, the only way to get rid of fear is to arise in faith. So faith is the answer. Faith in God, knowing his promises, knowing his goodwill, adding to it testimonies, that will eliminate the fears. Amen? Okay, fear becomes reality when it's spoken. So when you believe something in your heart and you speak it out of your mouth, that is an operation in faith. And whatever you believe in your heart and speak out of your mouth, it shall come true if you don't waver in that belief. Okay, so that happens with fears and the same thing happens with faith in God. Either way, if you're believing a fear and you speak it, it's going to come true. If you're believing a good thing from God and speak it, it's going to come true. So we need to make sure that our heart is filled with God's will and belief in his will. And then we need to make sure our tongue is speaking his will and not speaking the devil's will. Okay, well, just as we can speak our faith and cause it to come to pass, you can also do actions. Um, you can have faith aligned actions that will cause good things to happen. Uh, and you can have fear aligned actions that can also cause fears to come true. So, you know, faith works by speaking it, but faith also works if you take particular actions that prove your faith, then you can cause your faith to manifest. So we want to make sure that we don't have fearful actions in life because fearful fear aligned actions, that is an operation of faith and it can draw that negative thing into our life. So when you are in fear, Satan is your God. And when you are in faith, expecting good things, then Father, Jesus, and Holy Spirit are your God. Okay, so that's just a little comparison. And that leads us to our homework. So we can do this ourselves. And then certainly if we're working with somebody that we're discipling or leading out of addiction, and we need to work with them on their fears. So the first thing you need to do is just make a list of your fears. And we'll look at an example in a minute. Okay, so make a list of your fears. Then secondly, you want to find Bible verses that express God's goodwill and contradiction to those fears. So if somebody's afraid of, you know, sickness, then they need to find scriptures that talk about, you know, being healed by the stripes of Jesus, you know, Jesus bearing their sicknesses, Jesus redeeming them from curse, things like that. If they're afraid of, of evil events happening to them, then they need to study protection verses, right? So they just need to do a, a homework assignment and go find out what does God say about this topic that I'm fearful about. Okay, then the third thing would be to add to your list of scriptures, um, add some teachings, you know, consume teachings and testimonies on those topics. You know, so find a teacher that has some good content on whatever subject you're fearful about, consume that teaching, consume testimonies, and that's going to eliminate that fear. Okay, then number four is we need to be mindful of do I have fearful words and actions? Like, am I speaking forth my fears? Am I, do I have actions that are fearful actions? And so we need to identify those and stop doing them. And instead, we need to realign our mouth so it's speaking God's word and God's goodwill. We need to realign our actions so that they're not fearful actions, but they're faith-inspired actions. Okay, and so when we do these things, then fear is going to just depart from us. And we're going to be filled with faith in God. And we're going to have a good life experience. Okay, so let's talk about the cost of fear. Okay, so fear is dangerous. As we've been saying, fear is dangerous. It's faith in the devil. And if we're not careful, then we can cause those things to be manifested in our lives. And that's exactly what happened to Job. So the story of Job teaches us the cost of living in fear and acting upon those fears. Fear is faith in the devil. Job said that all of his fears had come true. Job said that all of his fears had come true. When we act upon our beliefs by speaking them or aligning our actions with them, we are exercising our faith 
which will cause what we believe in to manifest. We don't know what Job may or may not have been speaking, but we do know that he was acting fearfully by making sacrifices for his kids just in case they had sinned and they needed it. So he's acting in fear, like, I better go kill some animals every day just in case they sinned and made a mistake. So he was acting in fear, right? Um, So he was operating in fear, and unfortunately for him, he received the fruit of his faith, his negative faith. Satan fulfilled Job's faith in evil deeds happening, okay? So it's very unfortunate. Okay, so what we need to do, we need to eliminate fear. Fear is dangerous. We need good teaching on the promises of God to counter and to eliminate whatever we're fearful about. We need testimonies to further strengthen us. I mean, this is the answer to faith. This is how we build faith. So let's look at Job. So Job, um, we're going to look at after the fact, and then we'll come back and read what happened to him. So Job said, after all these terrible things happened, he said, for the thing I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. So before, what he's saying is, What he's saying after the fact, so we're about to read all the terrible stuff, but what he's saying after the fact is before these things ever happened, he was already greatly afraid of these things happening. He was already dreading these things happening to him. And so remember, if you come back here and look at our spectrum, if you are in fear, especially if you are dreadful, dread is a strong negative expectation. That's a strong negative faith in the devil, right? Unbeknownst to the person who's filled with that dread, it is an absolute confidence in the devil. And so Job's saying right here, you know, his faith was for terrible things to happen. And that's very unfortunate because he received it. So let's look at all the terrible stuff that happened. So in, we'll read from Job chapter one. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify his 10 sons and daughters. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Okay, so you see, this is a demonstration of fearful action. He's like, you know, like, well, just in case they sin, I better go kill a bunch of animals. Uh, And it says he did this regularly. So he's constantly operating in fear. He's constantly, you know, dreading, you know, that his kids have sinned and something bad's going to happen. You know, so he has a fear, and he has fear-based actions that are in motion here. Then it says, in starting in verse 13, Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, when the Sabians raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, and took them away, yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, Another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Okay, and then later, so so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Okay, so here, here we have like five terrible things that happened. And, you know, so we have two robberies with murder. We had this fire from heaven that killed animals and servants. We have the you know tornado or something like that that collapsed the house and killed all 10 of his children. And then he got sick with these boils. And all of this were works of Satan. And all of this are according to things that he was fearful about and things that he was dreading to happen. Okay, so you can see that When we are in fear, when we have dread in our heart and dread in our life, then we are in a dangerous place. Our faith is in the devil. And if we speak or act upon those fears, then we're likely to draw them into being. Okay, so we we have to eliminate fear. It's dangerous. Amen? Okay, so this is the last page. So we're almost done. So this is the homework that either we want to do for ourselves or we want to 
use with the person that we're discipling. So we already mentioned that our homework is to make a list of fears, find the Bible verses on God's goodwill, consume teaching, eliminate fearful words and actions, and realign our words and actions with God's goodwill. And when we do these things, our fears will disappear. So I just wrote up like two little examples. So you can just have your person just make a little table. You know, so just make a list. What are your fears? Um, what are, you know, let, let's just get through. So what are your fears, Bible verses, teaching, and what actions are you going to take? Okay, so let's just say um, we have a lady and she's afraid of, of violence. She's afraid of, of rape. So she should consume Psalm 91. It's all about protection. Um, she could also like look at Luke 10, 19. She can make a list of many other protection-related scriptures, right? But definitely go read Psalm 91 and take it to heart and make a confession out of it. Okay, from a teaching perspective, you know, she could be directed to go take certain teachings. You know, I have a couple of them. Many other uh, ministries have teachings on protection of God. And so you want to consume teaching on the protection of God, like invincible, no evil shall befall you, which is based on Psalm 91. Or there's a teaching called identity in Christ, protection. And that's more of a New Testament pers perspective on protection. And so whether it's from us or from anybody else, you just want to direct them to some good teaching on protection to help eliminate that fear of violence and rape. Okay. And then as far as actions go, you know, uh, I will, you know, these would be actions this person would have. I will stop fearful actions and proclamations. I will go out at night if I want to. Like, okay. So like, so fearful actions could be something like, you know, maybe the news says there's a rapist lurking around the neighborhood and then maybe this lady we're talking about here is afraid of being raped. And so she just locks herself up in the house and won't go out of the house because she's afraid something bad will happen. Well, that is a fearful action, right? You're, you're living in fear. Your actions are aligned with your fear. That's an operation in faith in that fear happening. Okay, so you want to do the opposite of, of what the fear is telling you. And instead of aligning your actions with that, align your actions with the word of God. And no evil shall befall me. Nothing shall by any means harm me, right? So, um. So this lady should stop doing whatever fear-aligned actions she's, she has. Um, maybe she was declaring things like, I know that I'm the next one he's going to get. You know, when people are afraid, they often speak their fears in a, like they often speak them forth, you know. And when you, when you do that, you're speaking your faith for a terrible thing to happen. And so if somebody's speaking like that, they need to stop declaring, I know that I'm the next one that he's going to get. You never want to speak forth your fear. You never want to claim that some terrible thing's going to happen to you. Instead of that, you want to start declaring the word of God, the promise of God, no evil shall befall me. Nothing shall by any means harm me. Right? And so um, you just want to have your person just kind of make a list of things they need to stop doing and a list of things they need to start doing. Okay, so we have the teachings, we have testimonies, and then we need to like have a positive confession, a confession of, of victory, of protection from scriptures that they've taken note of. Amen? Hey, Bobby. Uh-huh. Um, you know, I watch those uh, murder shows, the detectives and all that. Uh-huh. Um, and there was one on there that directly relates to what you just said. Um, it was a rapist that was running around in Arlington and um, she was telling her sister that she was afraid that she just knew that he was going to get her now out of the entire town of Arlington you know her sister was like don't think that don't think that well her sister did that rapist did get her and it killed her oh my gosh and yeah I know and it's exactly what you were just saying um, you know with oh I know this is going to happen I know this is going to happen yeah, no. Right. I thought, wow, that's just exactly what that show was. Exactly. And so that was a true crime story you're talking about. Yes. Yes. That was a true crime. Yes. See, I mean, it's powerful because it's an operation in faith. Okay. So maybe somebody's afraid of cancer. So maybe there's, um, maybe there's a lady, I'm just picking on breast cancer. Maybe there's a lady that has a long history of breast cancer in her family. You know, her mom had it, her sister had it, you know, the grandmother had it, great grandmother, great, 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 great grandmother. Like all the women in the, like up the, up the line, they all had breast cancer. And so th that can produce a definite fear, you know, or maybe it's some other disease, you know, it doesn't really matter, but maybe there's some sickness or disease that, you, that a person is afraid of. Well, they should go learn some scriptures about health, healing, 
re redemption from curse, redemption from sickness, things like that, anything healing related. They should consume teaching like we have teaching, obviously, Andrew Womack and Barry Bennett, Harris Bible College, John G. Lake Ministries. There's many ministries that have good teaching on healing. So that needs to be consumed. And then as you do that and as you consume testimonies, then the fear is going to start to go away. But then they also need to like write down some actions. Like, what am I going to do? I will stop declaring that I will get cancer because my mom, her mom, her mom, and every mom before had cancer. Thus, I will get cancer. I will stop speaking like that Okay, because that would be an operation in faith. I will declare that I am redeemed from cancer because I am redeemed from curse. I will declare that I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus and so forth. You know, so I was just trying to give a real quick example, but you can have your person go through it in more detail. But it's really, it's going to be the Bible verses, the teaching and testimonies that are going to kill this fear. And then we need to make sure we align our words and actions in a godly direction. And then we're going to have a good life experience. Amen. All right, well, that's a wrap for today. And so next time what we're going to do, let's come back here for a second. We're going to start talking about this kind of last um, step in the process, walking in love and holiness. We'll start talking about good spiritual habits that will keep us tuned up in faith and, and continuously getting strengthened and, and multiple other topics. So we'll start on that next week.